Roman history is filled to the brim with fascinating characters. However, there is an almost unknown intriguer who managed to gain influence and immense political power and almost ascended into imperial purple himself, Lucius Aelius Sejanus, the Praetorian Prefect under Tiberius. Under his jurisdiction, the Praetorian Guard became one of the most powerful institutions in Roman society, and it would set the tone for centuries of ambition and intrigue. Welcome to our video on Sejanus in the Roman Principate. Augustus's reforms made the rise of the Praetorian Guard possible. Seeing the chaos caused by the legions in Italy during the late Republic, Augustus garrisoned them permanently in the provinces. This was nominally to ensure compliance among the conquered peoples, and to put down any rebellions but it also served to cut out the outright sense of military dictatorship which had plagued the pre-Augustan era. To replace the legions, another institution was formed, the Cohortes Praetoria. By the time of the death of Augustus in 14 AD, the established Praetorians were commanded by two men of equestrian status, the father and son duo of Lucius Seius Strabo and Lucius Aelius Sejanus. Sejanus was born in the Etruscan city of Volsinii, and had reportedly accompanied the young Augustan heir apparent Gaius Caesar, the grandson of Augustus, to the east as a young man, as his family had impressive political connections. They were related to the consular Terentii house, and through the father's extensive marital family, had a number of consular step relatives, including the governor of Pannonia, Julius Blasius. All of this would naturally have enhanced the young Sejanus's future career prospects. The death of Augustus had triggered a mutiny among Blasius's legions in Pannonia, as suspended normal military routines led to a breakdown in discipline. When this news reached the successor, Tiberius, he sent his son, Drusus the Younger, with two Praetorian cohorts in order to quell the revolt. On the way, they were joined by some Praetorian cavalry and German bodyguards. This was the first attested use of the Imperial Guard in the field, and Sejanus was present. He was sent so that he could watch over Drusus, a mark of his already substantial influence over Tiberius. In 15 AD, Sejanus's father and co-prefect was appointed to the most prestigious post open to any equestrian the Praefectus Aegypti, the prefect or governor of Egypt, which was the emperor's personal province. This left Sejanus as the guard's sole commander, and his influence continued to rise throughout the years. In 21 AD, a new governor of Africa was required, and Sejanus used his influence to get his uncle the appointment. A year later, the massive theatre built by Pompey Magnus burst into flames, this would have been a catastrophe but for the swift actions of Sejanus and his Praetorians. They were quickly sent to douse the Inferno, an action which saved the city from the spreading flames, but not the illustrious venue. Tiberius heaped praise upon him, and the Senate voted that a statue be erected for his deeds. Sejanus proved his cruelty by ordering the lone dissenting senator's assassination a few years later. Despite Sejanus's increasing influence, Tiberius was unconcerned. Why? How had Sejanus managed to make such a strong impression on the emperor? By the middle of his reign, Tiberius was in his mid-sixties and had lost many of his friends. This left the generally distrustful princeps isolated, and he became reliant on the Praetorian prefect whom he did trust. Sejanus was viewed as a loyal servant of Rome, but unlike other courtiers, was not sycophantic. He was seen as an efficient administrator and commander with an independent mind. His lower equestrian status may also have helped him, as emperors were often suspicious of ambitious senators. Tiberius surrounded himself with equestrians, including Sejanus, who were viewed as less of a political threat. 
Nevertheless, in 23 AD, Sejanus made his first significant move to increase his power and the political potential of the Praetorian Guard, a move which would have consequences for the next three centuries of imperial rule. He took the apparently pragmatic step of installing and concentrating all the Praetorian cohorts into the newly finished Castra Praetoria, the vast Praetorian camp complex, which was surrounded by walls similar to the legionary fortresses. Before, the Praetorians had been scattered throughout Italy or in the vicinity of Rome. It may have increased the effectiveness and cohesion of the guard, but it also made the Praetorians more influential. The nature of Sejanus's ambitions were unclear at this point, but it seems that initially his aim was to isolate and dominate Tiberius. Ultimately, it is widely speculated that he wished to marry into the imperial family and even perhaps become the emperor's logical successor. There was one key obstacle to the devious plans of Sejanus, Tiberius's true-born son, Drusus. Even though the two had worked together in the past, there was significant animosity between them. Drusus bitterly resented the fact that the upstart Sejanus was now regarded as Tiberius's partner in labours, and made no attempt to conceal his dislike, even attempting to strike Sejanus on the cheek after the rivals had once argued. Meanwhile, Sejanus likely earned this dislike through his intrigue and the attempted political marginalisation of Tiberius's son. This would all soon come to a head. In order to surmount his dynastic obstacle, Sejanus reportedly seduced the wife of Drusus, Livilla. Her reasonings for embarking on this affair with the Praetorian Prefect are not known, but it is likely that she either wanted to protect the imperial interests of her sons, that she was sick of her husband's apparently violent temper, or that she was possibly just in love with Sejanus. Whatever the case, Sejanus realised he had to act soon. The shared consulship and the grant of tribunican power by Tiberius upon Drusus did not merely mark him as the successor. It also suggested that Tiberius, who had never liked being emperor, was soon to retire and would leave his son to rule instead. If Drusus was allowed to succeed, the career of the prefect, and perhaps even his life, might come to an untimely and violent end. Sejanus decided to use Lavilla, who was now firmly under his influence, to form a conspiracy to kill Drusus. A poison was chosen, the symptoms of which could easily be passed off as disease. In early September of 23 AD, Drusus's wine taster administered the draft. Drusus gradually became sicklier for several days, then passed away. Tiberius was devastated by his son's death, but remained convinced for years that his son had died from ill health. The first stage of Sejanus's grand design had been successfully accomplished. The path to power seemed open for him, as the brother of Germanicus, Claudius, was physically and mentally ailed while his sons were too young to rule. However, they all were of the imperial bloodline, while Sejanus was not. Acting accordingly, his next target was Agrippina, the widow of Germanicus since his death in 19 AD. He sought to isolate her by picking off her allies. Her influence was supposedly significant, especially among the former Rhine legions of her revered late husband, and it is said that she held more influence than the legates themselves. Agrippina was convinced that the adopted Tiberius had conspired to kill her true-blooded husband, and therefore wished for her sons to rule. It is this that initially caused hostility between the two. Sejanus whispered into the ear of Tiberius, arguing that the supposed Partium Agrippinae, Agrippina's faction, was treacherous and threatened his rule. So, with the Emperor's blessing, he set to cutting them down to size. His first target was Caius Silius, a respected senator and the commander of an army in Germania, who had bragged that if not for him, Tiberius would have been ousted during the mutiny at the beginning of his reign. 
Sejanus had him arrested on trumped-up charges of treason. The prefect had made it seem as if it was Tiberius attacking Agrippina and her supporters. Further proscriptions followed, and Sejanus grew ever bolder. He realized that being Praetorian prefect allowed him to destroy whomever he so wished if he had the emperor's unwavering trust. He became so powerful that falling out with him was a death sentence. Buoyed by his climbing of the ladder of power thus far, he composed a notorious letter to Tiberius in 25 AD, requesting a formal marriage to Livilla, with whom he had been having an affair for years. In this letter, he recalled the benefits heaped upon him by Tiberius and Augustus before him, but that he had never sought the splendour of high office. He deemed it a sufficient reward to serve such a master as Tiberius. Instead, the fairest honour he could hope for was a marriage tie to the house of the Princeps. He even hinted that Augustus himself had considered an equestrian for marriage to his own daughter, an attempt at hearkening back to the past to impress his emperor. The letter gives a truly fascinating insight into the political skill of Sejanus and the extent of his ambition, which seemed to be at this point to integrate himself into the dynasty. Though the letter was intelligent, Sejanus had overstepped his bounds and received a warning letter from Tiberius, writing that the senators were already complaining about his lofty status for a man of equestrian rank. Apparently alarmed by the revelation that he had an increasing amount of enemies in high places, Sejanus now began to encourage Tiberius to withdraw from the center of government. The emperor was never truly eager for the position and had withdrawn from politics several times before. In 27 AD, Tiberius journeyed through Campania to the secure island of Capri, where he would not be disturbed. He even enacted a law forbidding anyone from disturbing his quiet. Though historian Tacitus gives a number of reasons for the withdrawal to Capri, he cites the constant intrigues of Sejanus as the main factor, as he would constantly stoke mutual distrust amongst Tiberius and his family, even going so far as to convince the Princeps they wanted to poison him. It was at this time that another coincidence occurred which happened to show why Tiberius trusted Sejanus so much. At a key moment, when his party were dining in a cave restaurant near Naples, a rockfall almost killed the emperor, but Sejanus managed to save him. On the remote island of Capri, the Praetorians controlled access to Tiberius completely. The prefect also ordered spies to keep an eye on Agrippina and her family. In the absence of Tiberius, the power of Sejanus in the capital was unchallenged. His authority even extended to approving the candidates for consulship. Attempting to secure his power further, he now attacked Tiberius's most likely successor, Nero Julius Caesar, the son of Agrippina and Germanicus. Sejanus's agents and accomplices brought false accusations against him, which were made believable by Nero's often ill-advised behavior. His indiscreet remarks or complaints were exaggerated and reported to the isolated Tiberius on Capri, who was enraged at his adopted grandson's apparent brazenness. Sejanus, who actually still masqueraded as an ally of the matriarch, advised her and Nero to take refuge with her trusted Rhine legions. However, this was a trick, which made Tiberius even more paranoid. In an attempt to widen existing divisions, the prefects tempted the greed and jealousy of Nero's younger brother, another Drusus, by hinting that he might gain the principate for himself due to his brother's actions. The Praetorian then did what he had done to the original Drusus and enlisted his wife to turn on him. These schemes paid off. The younger Drusus was locked in prison, while Nero was exiled to Pontia and forced to commit suicide in 31 AD. The Praetorian prefect could hardly rise any higher. He was supreme the open partner of Tiberius' labours as his consular colleague, and equally feared and fawned upon even by those who most hated him. 
However, before the year was out, Sejanus and his family were dead, his statues destroyed, and his name erased from the public record. Again, we must ask why. Tiberius himself professed that the punishment of his former favourite was due to the revealed plots against the children of Germanicus, but some historians reject this as an excuse. It was possible that there was a conspiracy of murder against Tiberius himself. This is given further credence by Sejanus's negotiations with the German legions, who would likely support him if Tiberius were to perish. It is even possible that the murder of Drusus the Younger in 23 had been uncovered. Whatever the case, in mid-31 AD, Sejanus received an abrupt letter of denunciation in the Senate and was dragged off and unceremoniously murdered by his former subordinates. His family and acquaintances suffered equally afterwards, and a witch hunt for those he associated with resulted in many deaths including Lavilla, who was starved to death. The legacy of this extraordinary figure was widespread fear among the senatorial class and their accelerated sycophancy. Tiberius ruled until 37 AD, but never recovered from the blows inflicted by Sejanus. The destruction of Drusus the Younger in 23 and Nero Julius Caesar in 31 eventually had an unforeseen long-term consequence, leading to the ascension of one of the most insane emperors in history, Caligula, the sole male survivor of Sejanus's Inquisition. We will tell more Roman stories, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.